All right. Can you hear me? Did I press it well? Yes. Okay, great. So, first of all, I am Noemi. Um, I am a recently graduated master's student. I defended my thesis two days ago, so I'm actually really happy about it. I'm, professional. I'm a scientist now. So, <laughs> I focused on my master's thesis, I focused on using remote sensing to evaluate the relationship between the water discharge and water quality in the Baltic Sea. Uh, the contents of this presentation, I'll just go quickly through them. I just will tell you my aims and objectives, tell you a bit of the background, the study area, methodology, then we will discuss the results, and then we'll conclude limitations and conclusions. So the aim of my project was to find out to which extent the Ore River were, was actually influencing um, the concentration and dispersion of phytoplankton biomass and suspended particulate matter in the Baltic Sea, more precisely in the Bothnian Sea. And I, my objectives were to use remote sensing and bio-optical studies to improve the monitoring and management of the Baltic Sea, uh, to compare events of high and low discharge, to understand the influence, again, of the Ore River in the Bothnian Sea, and also to compare to different sensors, which are MODIS and OLCHI. But first of all, what are my uh, components? Suspended sediments, uh, defined as suspended particulate matter, that I will talk about as a SPM, um, is um, simply, simply particles of organic or inorganic material that are suspended within the water column. While the phytoplankton, we heard a lot about this already, uh, I'll just quickly say that it's at the base of the, the ocean food web and it feeds mu from microorganisms to multitones animals, uh, such, as, such as whales, and um, they are also photoautrophs, that means that they are able to convert inorganic to organic uh, carbon. And CHLA, which is chlorophyll, is a proxy of phytoplankton biomass, and this is what I'm going to refer to throughout the presentation. So the transport from river is pretty straightforward, you can imagine it. Uh, it simply occurs through land surface erosion, which causes finite particles to uh, go into the sea, to go into the water, and then being transported downstream to the sea. And the sediment inputs also influence is the phytoplankton production. Um, the reason why I decided to study this is because uh, of the numerous implications that it has, um, that SPM have on the, on the waters uh, in the marine ecosystems. And uh, first of all, sediment deposition creates habitats for marine organisms that basically feed of the organic carbon that they have been receiving. Uh, but excess, excessive sediment inputs can also increase water turbidity, and this is a problem for phytoplankton production because increasing water turbidity uh, means that there is um, the light that gets scattered into the water is decreases, and see, so this, is, this results in a decrease of algal growth. But the way I have investigated this is actually my favorite part, and it's through remote sensing. So remote sensing uses electromagnetic radiation, radiation to retrieve environmental information about the land, uh, water, and uh, the land, water, and atmosphere, and the particularity is that it can do it without being in contact with the parameter under investigation. So there are sensors like ocean color sensors that measure natural emissions produced by uh, the ocean, and these types of sensors are called passive, which is basically like a camera, uh, and it, because they solely rely on the, uh, the sunlight. The theory behind is pretty easy, so the sunlight leaves, uh, the sunlight arrives to the water, gets scattered multiple times, and then it reaches the sensor. The sensor is then able to understand which particles are in the water and at which concentration. Um, a particularity of remote sensing, something that also always have to be kept in mind, is that atmospheric correction, uh, because the scattering does not only occur in the water, but it also occurs in the atmosphere. So when you download the data, you have to make sure 100% that your data only reflected the scattering that happened into the water. Uh, based on the waters and on the components of the water, Morel and, Morel and Prior in 1976 Seven, they divided the waters in two different cases, which are case one and case two waters. Case one are the water with um, that are optically dominated by. Um, sedum, which is co color dissolved organic matter, and chlorophyll, why case two waters are uh, the waters that are dominated by um, SPM, sedum, and uh, they do not correlate with chlorophyll A. These type of waters are exactly the waters of the Baltic Sea. So this is the Baltic Sea day. I guess I will go really quickly through what the Baltic Sea is. Everybody 
I guess knows. And so it's a brackish sea enclosed between the 9 different countries and it, this particularity is the low salinity due to the large amount of freshwater inputs that they receive that it receives and also from uh, the little water exchange that there is with the North Sea. Uh, another part of my study area is the ore catchment which is a relatively uh, big catchment it is 2000 kilometers square and it's the particularity of it is that it's natural because it's 79% is covered by forest and only 0.2 is covered by urban areas so this means it's particularly natural. In addition it is a non-regulated river meaning that there are no anthropogenic uh, modifications on the river itself. Uh, so this is the reason why I decided to study exactly this, uh, this catchment and this river to understand how the influence of a natural river uh, could be on the Baltic Sea. So my methods were based on two different sensors that you can see here. So MODIS is a sensor uh, from NASA and it's on board of Aqua, of uh, Aqua, which is a satellite, and it has one kilometer resolution. But the data I have been using were four kilometer resolution, and that's because uh, they were time and space binned. Uh, in addition, this this type of satellite has been widely used for um, open sea studies. Uh, the data that I have been downloading were from backscattering coefficients and chlorophyll A and then I transformed uh, backscattering coefficient into SPM through literature, uh, through uh, equations I found in the literature and then I just used ArcMap and Python to extract data and some statistical analysis and validation. Instead of Olchi is um, a sensor on board of Sentinel-3 and this is from ESA. It has a 300 meter resolution. It means that you can see much, much closer to the coast. And this is the reason why it has been widely used for coastal waters. Um, the data processing and analysis was really similar. I just downloaded this time level two products from SPM and uh, Chlorophyll A. And then I used the SNAP to analyze, which has been, is a program purposely designed for this type of ocean color studies. So first, my first analysis, I was trying to understand where the, my particles were go, where were more uh, prone to go. So I did throw, I drew this, uh, three polygons, which are small, medium, and large at 30, 60, and 90 kilometers from the coast. And I also analyzed on a long term how were they uh, varying. So I realized that the majority of the particles are obviously closer to the coast, which was a quite expected result. And also that um, over time, I had an increase. I had a significant increase in terms of chlorophyll A, but I did not have it, uh, any significancy for part suspended particulate matter, although it's quite clear from the graphs, especially the one above that, um, that SPM is still increasing over time. But although this uh, analysis did not tell me if the O River was actually influencing the particles, so I have decided to concentrate on two years, uh, which are indicated here with the, bar, with the yellow bars. And you can tell that 2018 has the highest river discharge. Uh, and 2020, although it was uh, used as a low di river discharge, even if it's not the lowest, because the lowest is clearly 2011, although because of my um, analysis before that I realized that there was an increase um an increasing trend, then I had to decide to take two years that were quite close to each other, so I could also download the data from both MODIS and OLCHI, and I decided this exactly two years. So this is a visual comparison. Uh, it's quite it's quite clear that uh, the years of two, my May 2018 and May 2000 uh, sorry May 2018 SPM and CHL in both cases there is um, a quite majority of bright pixels, meaning that the concentrations of both SPM and chlorophyll were much higher when the discharge was higher. Uh, and instead, on the other side, um, um, May 2020 did not show me, especially in SPM, the pixels are quite dark, meaning that there is uh, not much concentration. However, the problem with this analysis was that um, I did include parts of the coast that were not really related to the Ore River. So I couldn't be completely sure that that part uh, was, that those that concentration was due to the Ore River. So I I had to decide to go much deeper and closer to the coast, and this is when I decided to use Olchi. So I could see at 25 kilometers from the coast, and this is pretty clear, 2018, there are six images uh, from 2018, and there is um, a clear plume coming from the Ore River, and uh, this is, has also a relationship with the discharge, so the days with the highest discharge have uh, the highest sediment plume. And you can see this also from the last two images of 2018, which uh, where the uh, discharge is really low and there is basically no concentration and no plume. 
Uh, May 2020 instead, it's really different, you can tell. And um, there is a basically no relationship between discharge and um, concentration or error dispersion. So uh, this is probably due to a much warmer year that 2020 was because um, the majority of the, of the particles might have been transported during the melting season in April. And uh, so this obviously had decreased the amount of particles transported later in time in, in May. Of course, I had to do some assumptions also in this case to make sure that my data uh, were actually coming from the Or. I was actually referring to the Or River, and I. You can see this in the little map up there. The red parts are the ones that I did not consider, uh, and that's probably because um, I thought that the particles in those specific areas were coming from other rivers that are nearby the Or River. Regarding CHL, I had really similar results. So uh, chlorophyll has behaved exactly in the same uh, way in 2018, but 2020 shows me a big difference with, with TSM. If you compare the two, there is no colors here and there is much more colors here in 2020. And, and I was wondering how could that be possible if I had no plumes? And then I was going to the literature and it made sense because uh, if the, I don't have any plumes, that means that my turbidity also um, is, is, much, is much lower. So uh, the light gets scattered much more and the, and the phytoplankton and, and, uh, is much more prone to, um, to, to be concentrated. And this is why there is a much darker red part, especially uh, in uh, on the 25th of May 2020. Uh, besides the visual comparison, I also wanted to do something a bit, uh, to go a bit deeper and, and more statistically and mathematically proven. So I decided to under, try to understand if the particles were, had a certain pattern, were following a, cert a certain pattern in terms of dispersion along a transect. The transect, you can see it here, are the black dots over there. Um, and I figured out that in both cases, SPM 2018 and 2020, I had a really similar pattern in which the majority of the particles are concentrated within 13.21 kilometers from the coast, and then they decrease. And this is probably, um, is probably due to the difference in sea level depth uh, in that specific area. And um, also instead of CHL, so chlorophyll did not show me much difference. Um, they, there was no pattern at all, and that's probably because um, chlorophyll, uh, that's probably because phytoplankton is much more prone to stay on the top layers of the water, so uh, it did not decrease particularly, particularly with uh, the decrease in depth, increase in depth. Uh, I also did, I did also draw some polygons to understand where my areas were and where was um, the the particles. I'm not sure you can see them here, but they are black polygons around my darkest areas. And I, I correlated and I did a linear regression for, for them and the discharge and I figured out that in both cases, if you see SPM 2018 and CHL 2018 as well, the orange lines, they are uh, both significantly, um, sig significantly correlated uh, and also strongly correlated, meaning that it is probable that the O River does influence quite a lot um, the sea waters and the coastal waters of the Baltic Sea. Uh, in 2020, instead, I could not see any significant correlation, but I did uh, see some uh, moderate correlation, uh, even if not significant for a suspended particulate matter. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I also had to do a quick validation. I just wanted to make sure my data were actually correct. Uh, so um, I, I compared this with in situ turbidity data that then I have transformed. This data were coming from three different stations on the, around the Baltic Sea. Uh, two of them are really close to the estuary. One of them is much more south. Um, and the old sheet data has have given me an overestimation, which is understandable because many papers have before uh, found um, an overestimation. While Modis data, because they were monthly average, they did not show me any relationship, and that was probably because they didn't really, um, they didn't really reflect the day that they were they were uh, supposed to reflect. But anyway, I had really little amount of uh, in situ data uh, to make an actual valid 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 validation. So, 
Yeah, so uh, limitations on my studies is always the easiest part because you perfectly know what you did wrong when you do a thesis. So um, um, I, I used level three data that I might have instead used level two um, to, to get much closer to the S3. I also included pixels, as I was previously, say, previously saying, that did not really correspond to the O river. And also I might have made possible mistakes during the substitution of invalid pixels. Regarding all G, the daily image I had six images from May, but they uh, were supposed to represent the whole month. But of course, they were only six days. Uh, and I might have made some imprecisions in the delineation of the area. Overall, MODIS did show me that level, level three data can uh, be used to analyze long-term changes, but they didn't work really well for the Baltic Sea because of the algorithm utilized. Uh, while OLCHI did show me that uh, there was an increase in both SPM and CHL, uh, significantly proportional to discharge, and also maximum dispersion about 30 13 kilometers offshore. Uh, but of course, more data are required for reliable validation. And then just a few recommendations, maybe next for the next studies, uh, to create a Python code instead of just making it manually the, uh, <laughs> the uh, polygon, and also maybe to combine Meris and Olchi data to create um, a much longer time frame, because Olchi was launched in 2016. So yeah, so thank you. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>